All right, turn, if you would, in your Bibles now to the book of Revelation, where I go back to our Prophecy and Promise series, preaching through the book of Revelation, and want to share Revelation chapter 10. I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground in a short amount of time. Uh, I may not get through the whole thing I had this morning. That will be okay, but I'm going to bring this message to you, still time for a witness, still time for a witness. You know, we live in uncertain days, we live in dark days, live in troubling days, but nothing like the trouble that will take place during the time of the tribulation. And that's what we've been talking about, time of tribulation. We've talked already about uh, the rapture, we've talked about the rise of Antichrist, we've talked about the seven seals being opened, and then we've been uh, leading up, we've been going through the seven trumpets uh, that were being blown, and we've gotten through six. And through that period of time, there's been a few different intermissions or pauses that God puts in place. And, as, and remember, as I've been teaching you, all these things, while happening, aren't necessarily happening one and then the other, then the next one, then the next one, then the next one. So they're, they're intermixed and they're happening in many ways at the same time. In other words, many of the plagues, many of the, the, the seals and the trumpets that are taking place are happening overlapping um, and the, the, we have some pauses though that God gives in the scripture and there's some pauses that God gave in that period of time of tribulation and uh, trials and plagues that are being poured out and here is one that we come to this is another one that we come to this is in between now the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet There's another angel that's going to show up. And so I'm going to be reading several places in chapters 10 and 11, and we'll just see how far we get. I'm going quickly through this period. The reason I'm doing that is because I want to focus on a few things. But in chapter 10 and 11 is taking place basically, as I'm reading this, kind of the middle part of the tribulation. In, In fact, just to kind of get a little ahead of myself, there's, the, the tribulation is broken up into two periods of three and a half years. There's a three and a half year period that there's going to be the Antichrist rising to power and him forming the coalition and in large part peaceful uh, treaty with Israel rebuilding Jerusalem, coming together for Jerusalem, uh, an alliance with Jerusalem and with Israel. And then there's at the middle part of that three and a half years, the Antichrist is going to violate that treaty and he's going to sacrifice a pig on the altar in the temple, which of course will enrage the Jews and then all hell, if you will, will break loose. Although plagues will be going on the entire time, but there will be a violation of that treaty. That's kind of where we're at here, but we've not yet gotten to that violation. And then there's three and a half years of all terror, all horror, all judgment being poured out until Christ comes and then rules and reigns for a thousand years. And so really you can look at it as almost three periods, three and a half years, three and a half years, and then there's a middle area, but I want you to see that's kind of where we're at here, but even in the middle of the tribulation, there is still time, there's still time for a witness, and we're going to look at three different witnesses, or three different sets of witnesses in this section, and then I'm going to apply that to us. So let's begin reading in Revelation chapter 10 and verse 1, and I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as if it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth. And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that are that in are, and the sea and the things which which are therein, that there should be time no longer. 
But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants and the prophets. Let's pray one more time. Father, I pray that you'd help us to understand these passages as, as best you as best we can. You've given us your word, and you intend for us to understand your word by the Holy Spirit as he helps us to understand. We ask for that today. God, also help us to understand there are some things that we cannot under, yet understand and are yet to be revealed to us. Help us to be satisfied with what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to see the first witness that I'm going to talk about this morning is the mighty angel. Now this, we see the word angel is mentioned more than at least 60 times in the book of Revelation. And the, the word angel refers to servants. It refers to them as messengers. There are also demons that are referred to as angels because remember demons are fallen angels. And also the pastors in chapters 2 and 3 of the seven churches are referred to as angels. We've talked about that before, about how you already know that your pastor is an angel. But there are different angels that we see in this book. This angel is different. And I want you to see that. This angel is different. This angel is amazing. This angel, it says, is significant. He is clothed with a cloud. And I want you to understand his identity, if, he, if we can look at that. His identity. The angel is different. He is clothed with a cloud. All right? He is, has a rainbow on his head. He has a face like the sun. He has feet as pillars of fire. And he has a voice like a lion. This is unlike any angel we have ever seen anywhere in all the Bible. Now we've seen mighty angels that have six wings. We've seen angels that do battle. We've seen angels that, st that stand guard. We've seen angels around the throne. We've seen angels that speak to people. But we've never seen an angel like this. So who is this angel? Well there's lots of speculation but I think that it's safe to say this angel is actually the king of angels if you will but the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the king. The reason I say that is because as we look, we see that he is clothed with a cloud. Well, God is often identified with clouds. Uh, it, it, Jesus Christ is God. God led uh, the Israelites with a cloud in the wilderness. A cloud rested on Mount Sinai when the Ten Commandments were given to Moses. Uh, the Bible says in Psalm 104.3, he makes the cloud his chariot. When Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, he ascended into the clouds. And when he comes again, he will come in the clouds. Clouds are often associated with the Lord. Also the rainbow being on his head. The rainbow is a sign of what? The covenant. The covenant that he gave with Noah. When Noah came out of the ark after the flood, God put the rainbow in the sky to, to signify his covenant that he would never ever flood the earth again. It was a sign of his promises. Uh, also, his face being like the sun matches the description in chapter 1 of verse 16 of Revelation where it talks about Jesus' face shining like the sun. His feet as pillars of fire corresponds to the description in chapter 1 of 15 of Revelation where it talks about his feet being like a uh, uh, furnace. Also, the voice like a lion correlates to Revelation 5.5 as the Lion of Judah is used to describe our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Also, we, listen, not only is his description that of what would match up to Jesus Christ, but also his testimony that he gives. He utters, he gives some hidden truth. And you say, what do you mean some hidden truth? Well, one of the things that often fascinated me as a kid, it, it, it growing up and reading my Bible and being taught in church, was here was this passage where there are seven thunders that utter their voices. Now remember, Revelation now, you have seven seals that are opened. You have seven trumpets that are blown. You have seven vials or bowls that are poured out. But you also have seven thunders. And there's a description there given of all the other judgments, but these seven thunders... John goes to write what he heard. In other words, the, the angel uttered these seven thunders, or the seven thunders uttered their voices, and John was about to write there in verse 4, but he hears a voice from heaven saying, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. There are some truths about God. There are some prophecies, some truths, some things in the Bible that were 
given an inkling of, but not the whole truth, or not the whole facts, not the whole picture. There are certain things that God has for us that have yet to be revealed. There are some things about God, and, and again, whether it be why does God allow suffering, or why does God do this, or why did God do that, there are some things in life that we're just not meant to completely understand in this life. And this is one of them. There are certain truths about God that he's yet to reveal to us. We can't understand everything, nor are we meant to understand everything. Just like if you go back to Acts, when Jesus, before he ascended into heaven, and or when he did ascend into heaven, well, let me rephrase, before he did, they were saying, is now the time when you are going to set up your kingdom, Lord? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know now the times and the seasons. In other words, there is a time set, but it's not yet for you to know. And there are some things in Scripture that we just cannot know, and there are some things certainly in the book of Revelation that we can talk about, we can speculate, but we need to understand we just don't know for sure. It's not been re re revealed to us yet. You say, well, why would God do that? When God doesn't reveal something to you clearly, number one, have you already obeyed what you do know? Because he's under no obligation to reveal to you what you don't know until you do what you do know. If you're not doing what he's already made clear to you, don't expect him to give you what you don't know. But also, when God shows us something or doesn't reveal something to us in entirety, it's so that we come to him like a child and seek him. And it's okay to ask him. It's okay to say, hey, why is, and he may not yet answer us. But the point is, it's to draw us to him. Just like a child, when he comes, says, well, why? Why? How come? Why? Who are they asking why? They're asking their mom. They're asking their dad. They're asking whoever it is. They want to know why, but it drew them to the parent. It drew them to the person. And God allows things so that we look to him and to trust him. And I want you to see what this angel, not just his description, but also what he's testifying of, if you would, and he's giving a witness. He's giving a testimony. Verse 6, he swear by him that liveth forever and ever. Who's that? Well, that's God, who created heaven and the things that are therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which in are therein, that there should be time no longer. Well, what is he doing? He's giving truth. He's giving praise, he's giving honor, he's giving a testimony is what he is doing. He is sharing some factual uh, uh, witness. He is sharing some historic witness. Notice he's, he's giving facts, the fact that he lives forever and ever. He's giving facts that he created the heaven and the earth and all that is in them. But he's also giving some historic, he did create them. So it's also historic truth. It's also prophetic truth. That therein that there should be time no longer. In other words, he's saying, listen, time is going to end. There is an end coming. And it's conclusive. He's saying that, listen, the mystery is about to be concluded. What's the mystery? The, the revelation of God, of the gospel, of what he's doing is about to come to an end. God was in the purpose of drawing people to himself. God is in the, in the business of, of saving people. And that time is about to come to the end. God is about to make all things new again. Now, we're still at least three and a half years away from that in the tribulation period. But he's saying this is going to happen. He's giving not just hidden truth, the seven thunders under their voices, but also open truth, clear truth, plain truth. He spoke boldly. He spoke plainly. He spoke victoriously. You say, what do you mean he spoke victoriously? Because if we notice, his feet are planted on the earth and on the water. And the image here is of a victorious, conquering champion that we see. And he's proclaiming that the earth is his. All that's created is his. It, it, it's the Lord's. It's God's. That's what it belongs to. It may look like right now that it belongs to the devil. And in some ways, in part, if you will, it's been given over to the devil. We don't have to look long at our TV screen or listen to our radio or look at the newspaper or, or social media to see that the world and the devil is in control. It doesn't take us long, does it, to figure that out. 
But the reality is that God still is control, and here he is showing, once again, reclaiming, if you will, saying, okay, now is going to be the time when I'm going to show I'm still in charge, and God is still owns it all, and we're going to make all things new. His activity, the posture that he gives there is of the conquering king, claiming that possession of his territory. The whole world, one foot in the water, one foot on the land, and only, say, why do you think it's the Lord? All those things, but only a victorious Savior could make those claims. I want you to see very quickly, let's move on from that. And I know, again, like I said, I want to cover some ground here. I want you to see, look on later in the chapter, actually in chapter 11 now, look in chapter 11. Let's begin reading in verse 1. And there was given me a reed, that's John now, like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, uh, saying, Arise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave it out. Measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city, that they shall tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, that they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut up heaven that it rain not in the days of the prophecy and have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord is crucified. So that's Jerusalem now. And they of the people and the kindreds and the tongues of the nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and shall make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two, these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and the great fear fell upon uh, them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended unto heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. I want you to see these two witnesses. Now listen, again, I'll go back, and if you've been raised in church and been taught anything about Revelation, you are aware, have you heard, of these two witnesses that will take place in Revelation. That God will, God will bring up or raise back or bring back two witnesses that he will, that will serve him. Now again, when does this happen? Well, it's going to happen somewhere in the beginning of the tribulation. Because for three and a half years, they're going to give testimony and prophesy. And at the end of that, the Antichrist or the devil using the Antichrist will make war against them and kill them when their testimony is over. So who are these two witnesses? In all my life, people have speculated. And we're going to speculate a little bit about who are the two witnesses. Now, understand in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter who the two witnesses are. And we can't know for sure. Let me be clear about that. I'm going to give you who some scholars say. I'm going to give you who I think. But understand what really matters is, is that God is going to have two witnesses. And just like there was the angel or our Lord giving testimony and witness, there are also two witnesses. God will always have his witnesses. Even in the tribulation time, God will always have people who will give a witness. So who are they? Well, some people think that it possibly is Moses and Abraham. And the reason they think that is because Moses and Abraham are the two greatest figures in all of the Old Testament as far as the Jews are concerned. In other words, today, if you were to talk to people in Israel or of Jewish ancestry, that especially that were of the religion of Judaism, they would say the two greatest forefathers is Abraham and Moses. Abraham was the father of Israel. Moses led the people out of Israel. Egypt and out of bondage. And so therefore, in the minds of non-Messianic Jews, those are the two. There are also some that think it might be Elijah and Moses. And the reason they think that is, again, because both Moses and Elijah did miracles in their lifetime. 
And certainly we see miracles being done by these two witnesses. But God is the one that gave Moses and Elijah the power to do miracles. And God can give anybody power to do miracles that he so chooses fit to do or to, to give. Some think it might be John the Baptist that has come back because he was the one that prepared the way for Christ to come. He was the forerunner of Christ to come the first time and maybe perhaps he is one of the two witnesses who will prepare for Christ to come the second time. There are some that also think it might be John the Apostle because in chapter 10, we didn't read this, but uh, in verse 8, the, uh, or the end of chapter 10 there, there's a voice that says unto John, you have yet to give prophecy. There's going to be more prophecy for you to give. And so they think that this is where he's being brought back to continue to preach and prophesy, and also because when the book of, of the Bible, or when the book of Revelation, the Bible ends, John is still alive, and there's no record of his death, and so some people think that perhaps he never did die, and therefore he'll have to come back. <clears throat> it could be two unknown individuals. Uh, in other words, some scholars say, we don't know who it is, we can't know who it is, but we think it's two nobodies as far as you've never heard of them before because their names are not mentioned here. I personally think it's going to be Enoch and Elijah. The reason I think it's going to be Enoch and Elijah is because Enoch and Elijah, neither one of them faced death in this lifetime. And where I get, and the, reason, the reason for my logic or reasoning is, is the Bible says that every man has to face death. Now, again, is that generalization that, that was made in the Bible as far as, generally speaking, everybody's going to face death? Uh, maybe, but I do know this. There are, only two, there are only three individuals that ever lived and have not died, and actually Christ was being one, died but was raised to life again. There were others who were raised to life again, but they died again. Neither Enoch nor Elijah have yet to face death on this earth. And so therefore, that's just simply my simple logic for why I believe, and many scholars agree, that it's very possibly Enoch who was not, but God took him, and Elijah who is taken to earth, or taken to heaven in a whirlwind of fire. We can't know for sure, but we can know this. They are God's witnesses, and they are used by God for his purposes, and we know for sure that they gave a testimony. They preached the gospel. They prophesied. The word prophecy there in chapter uh, 3, I'm going to give power unto my two witnesses. They shall prophesy. In other words, they're going to preach. They're going to preach the gospel. And so we know that they're going to be preaching about Jesus Christ. They're going to be preaching about God. They're going to be preaching a message of judgment, but also one of grace and salvation. And so that's their witnesses. They're preaching the truth of God. They're preaching the truth of Christ. And they're going to preach with power. Listen, they're going to have power for three and a half years. They're going to have not just power in their preaching, they're going to have power to do miracles, to shut up heaven so it doesn't rain, to turn water into blood. They're going to have a miraculous protection where nobody is able to harm them. If anybody tries to harm them, they will be harmed uh, and they will live for three and a half years, giving that testimony, smutting the earth with plagues, but preaching and being supernaturally protected by God. And here's the key. They're going to be protected by God until their witness is finished. Look, if you would, in verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony. Can I just tell you this? I, you've heard me say this several times, so I'm going to say it again. Your testimony is not to be finished until God's finished with your testimony. Your life is not going to end until God is done with your life and says, come on hither. If you're a Christian, listen, you, we don't have anything to fear. Not the coronavirus, not, not, not the government, not the enemies, not uh, some other religion, not those that are in opposition to God, not any group, not anybody. God, when he's done with us, if, we're li if we belong to him, if we're living for him, if he's done with us, that's when our time is done and that's when we will go and you won't go until then. Just as it was for these witnesses. I want you to see very quickly, uh, by the way, uh, when their witness is done, as we read, they will be destroyed by the devil or by the Antichrist and they will lie in the streets for three and a half days 
And people will cheer and people will celebrate their deaths. Isn't it amazing how a world apart from God will celebrate all the wrong things? Isn't it amazing how, can you even imagine people that are going to be, they're going to, we're going to celebrate. Their, I don't celebrate anybody's death. I, I, I can think of two individuals, I suppose, that part of me celebrated their death in my lifetime. And that was bin Laden and Saddam Hussein. Uh, and even then, up to their death, I'll be honest with you, I was praying for their salvation. I had care for their soul. I believe that was God-given. There was times that I got so mad and wanted to go to war myself, but I'm still saying that there was care for the soul. But here is a world so godless that they cheer when God's servants are dead, and they leave them dead three and a half days, but God won't leave them there. God will raise them back up and call them to heaven, and all will see as they stand up and life comes back into their bodies, and nobody will be to deny God's power and God's witness. Very quickly, as I'm out of time, I want you to see the last group, and that's the 24 witnesses, the 24 elders, 24 witnesses. Look, if you would, now, on down in chapter 11, and it says, And the seventh angel sounded, that's the trumpet now, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power, and thou hast reigned. So here we saw the angel giving testimony. We saw the two witnesses giving testimony, or giving a witness. And now we're going to see these 24 elders giving witness. Well, who are the 24 elders? Well, we've seen them before in the book of Revelation. In chapter 4, it talks about the 24 elders who sat on 24 thrones around the throne of God. And they were there. So who are they? Again, there's some speculation about who they could be. Uh, primarily, it's unknown. We don't know exactly. But we do know this. Some people think it's the twelve. It's representing the twelve apostles and the twelve patriarchs. The twelve apostles, of course, you know, eleven of them, and then most likely Paul is considered the twelfth apostle in, in in many circles. But who are the twelve patriarchs? You ever wonder that? There's twelve. It said twelve and twelve. That's twenty four. But who are the twelve patriarchs? The twelve patriarchs are found in the book of Genesis, chapter five. It's the ancestors from Adam down to Noah. Those are the 12 patriarchs in Israel. And some think it's representing those 24. Uh, what we do know is this. They are believers. And what I believe they are is a representative of all believers, or you could say of the church, but also the Old Testament believers. In other words, all believers that are in heaven, that will include us, the church, are, going to, are represented by these 24 elders. And what are the elders doing or what are these witnesses doing? Now, these are in heaven. And what are they doing? They're giving testimony. They're giving a witness. That's what they're doing. Listen, the, the, their, their testimony is they're going to tell the truth about God and his power and his victory. That's what they're doing in these verses. Uh, they're telling what, that he was and that he is and that he is going to be victorious. That he did have power, he does have power, and he will show his power. That's what they're doing. They're also falling down on their faces and they're worshiping God, saying, listen, we give thanks and we give praise. Listen, church, I believe this is us in heaven and we're giving testimony of who God is. And we're worshiping him and we're praising him. And we're telling the truth about God. There is still time, even in the tribulation, for witness. But we're not to the tribulation yet. And so I want to wrap up this way. I want to talk about our witness. I want to talk about our identity very quickly. We are his. We operate under the same authority as these witnesses, witnesses operated. We are his servants. 
We are his messengers. We are to exemplify his love, his life, his hope, his mercy, and his grace now. We are to witness now on this earth while there is still light, while there is still day, while there is still time before our time is up. Whether it be through death or whether it be through the, tr- the rapture of the church, we are to give witness now here just like they gave there. You say, well, what do you mean? What, what do you mean just like they gave? Boldly, clearly, plainly. That's how these witnesses all gave testimony. There was no hiding. There was no hiding in the shadows. It was up front. It was on a mountain. It was in heaven. It was in the streets. It was with a hand raised to heaven with one foot on the, on the earth, one foot in the sea. There was nobody that could not see their testimony, nor should there be anybody that can't see our testimony. Oh, how we ought to witness in this life. Oh, how we ought to give testimony in this life. With all that we do, And by the way, when we do, we will do so with power. God's word will not return void. That's one of the reasons why this, this, many of you have been watching online that I do the the 60 seconds or less. And all I'm doing is I'm just reading a verse or two. And the reason I'm doing that is because I've said, I think I've shared this before, but my words, my preaching, my giving a testimony, just my words, giving an illustration might return void. But God's word will not. And so that's the reason I do that. We need to be sharing God's word with power, God's word plainly, God's word clearly. It will not return void. And as we give our testimony, we give thanks and we give praise and we're joyful and we're open and we're passionate for a world in need. I want to close with this little illustration and then I'm done. I want to give this illustration about a woman who is in desperate need for her son. Her son was sick, and her son said, you know, Mama, I I think that the one thing that might make me feel better is some fresh fruit. And in that day, when this story is being told, fruit was not easy to come by. It wasn't like you can go today, go to Walmart. Well, you can't really get fresh fruit at Walmart, I guess. But, you you know, not like today we can go to the store and you can get fruit and fresh fruit and farmer's markets and all these kind of things and where fruit is relatively inexpensive. Uh... In this day, the story is being told, fruit was costly. Fruit was rare. Fruit was scarce. And this woman said, I don't have much money, but I'm going to go see if I can find you some fruit. And as she was walking to town, she walked by what looked like a palace. And she saw this gated uh, a property. And she saw in this gated property, she looked at the gate and she saw this huge mansion. And in front of the mansion, she saw a trellis. And on this trellis, she saw a beautiful grapevine. And on this beautiful grapevine, there were some huge bunches of beautiful grapes. And she saw the gate was ajar. And she said, I just wonder if perhaps I could buy some fruit from the owner of this home. And so she pushed in through the gate and she walked into the garden and she began to look around. And as she did, as she did, a voice stopped her and said, Hey, what are you doing? You're not allowed in here. And she said, and she turned and she saw a gardener and she said, oh, sir, I'm so sorry. I, I, don't, mean to, I don't mean to be trespassing, but my, my son is sick and, 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 and just hoping that perhaps some fruit, some grapes and the antioxidants and the things in it might help. And that's just what he's desiring to be able to eat, to give him some strength. It's the only thing he can keep down. And I'm just hoping perhaps I could buy some grapes from you. And she said, you can't buy these grapes. These are the king's grapes. This is the king's vineyard. You cannot buy these grapes. You must go, and you must go now. And in tears, as she began to walk away, and as she began to walk out the gate, she heard another voice. And the voice said, wait just a minute. Wait just a minute. Why, why, don't go. And she heard a kindly voice, and she turned, and it was the king. And the king said, why are you here? And she, said, and she explained her story again about the grapes. And she said, oh, if I could just have some grapes. And the king instructed his gardener to cut down not one, not two, not three, but begin to pile grapes into her basket, into her arms. And she said, oh, I can't pay for these. I don't have enough money to pay for these. And he said, the king's grapes are not for sale. but They are given to you freely. Enjoy. May they bring healing and hope to you and your family. That's the gospel that we have. That's the witness that we have. 
That's the salvation that we have. God's grace cannot be bought. It cannot be earned. It cannot be won. But it is given freely by a loving king for you and for me. That's the testimony that we have been given. That's the testimony of which we are to proclaim. And even as we begin to, again, not socially or physically gather here, oh, how will we witness? Oh, call somebody. Write a letter. As you're passing, give a testimony. Share a post. Listen, the things that I post, I have people sometimes ask me, is it okay if I share this? Yes, it's okay to share. Share. Share the messages that we post. Share the testimonies that we post. Share the Bible verses that we post. And then you do the same and share those of the same. You know, it's so interesting how the things that we share in social media, we share the joke, we share the jest, we share the, the, the silly illustration, we share the making fun of somebody, we share the conspiracy theories. But will we share the gospel? Will we share the word of God? Will we share the truth? Oh, that we will have a testimony while there's still time for a testimony. In love, in passion, with grace, is led by our King. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd help us today. Oh, God, that we would have a testimony today. A testimony of you, a testimony of the truth, a testimony of your love, a testimony of your grace, a testimony of your forgiveness, a testimony of what you have done and are doing and will do. Oh, God, what a terrible time the tribulation will be. Oh, God, what dark days we live in today. But, God, there's still hope. Oh, God, there's still love. Oh, God, there's still time. There's still grace. There's still room at the cross. Oh, God, help us to go in power, to go in courage, to go under your authority and your protection until our testimony is done. May we trust you, believe in you. If there's somebody here today or in the sound of my voice that does not know you, has not yet repented of sin, has not yet come to you for salvation, oh, today would it be the day that they would come, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Stay with me if you would. We're going to have just a verse of invitation. His instruments are going to play just softly. We'll not sing. We're just going to play. Maybe you're here today, and maybe you need some courage to give a testimony. Maybe your eyes need to be open to the fact that you're here so that you can give a witness. Maybe you need God to help you to know what to say, how to say it. Maybe he needs to season your testimony with grace. Maybe you need to come and say, God, help me to be more loving, more kind, more gracious, more courageous. Won't you come and ask him? God, maybe you need to say, God, give me an opportunity. Maybe you need to come and say, God, oh, won't you save me? Won't you come today?